and she, the only thing I recognize on her, she's very good, but she gets very emotional over, like when her dad was sick. I, I was her to die within the she, next hour. Yeah, she has yeah. a jerky. Yeah, and, and it, so. It doesn't mean that going forward we won't see some others. Mm -hmm. Like you remember the young couple that had the baby? Yeah. She just came into church. Mm -hmm. We can ask them next year. Yes. And maybe yes. 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 Exactly. Exactly. But I, I understand. I, the, I think it's good though that he gets saved yeah. because yeah. I would rather that than for him to be worried about. You know, yeah. See, what I worry about is it's like right now. It's in the tent. So in other words, I guess what I'm saying was all of this is all this crazy stuff. You know, and, 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 and you know, it, one thing that's involved with this is going to be that not always. Yeah. And, and you never know. It could be as simple as I can't do it this year. I'm doing right. this. Or yeah. my right. son did this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, see, Sarah. Dan interviewed Cynthia. Just keep this, think, yeah. about, think about this. Father Andy worked on this years ago with her and her husband. I just, not, I'm just wondering if maybe you and Father Jason and Father Andy might. It just depends. Maybe it's worth talking about. Yes, it is. 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 Oh, yeah. Very well. And, you know, but you know. He'll do fine. But it's like you said, Thanks. there's going to be. Uh, yeah. Testing, one, two, three, testing. Are we pretty close? Okay. I can. Can I start? Okay. Thomas said he could hear you. Pardon? Thomas said he could hear you. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Elizabeth sent this to me. Pardon? Elizabeth sent this to me. That's what they're going to be using. Oh, okay. Okay, good. I've, I've got that. Oh, good. Yeah. I didn't know whether yeah. to know. Right. Thank Have you. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Thomas said he could hear me. It's great to have this great audience out here. And um, our subject tonight is sin and morality. And... Um, they kind of combine them after a period of time, and I will talk about that when we talk about maybe uh, form conscience and this kind of thing. But uh, 
they pretty much go hand in hand. Uh, as far as sin, what is sin? And I've given you a handout that you can follow along a little bit. It's a deliberate thought, word, deed, or a mission contrary to the eternal law of God. And you think, well, what, what does that mean? What it really means is that all of us interiorly, we know the difference between right or wrong. That's called natural law by a lot of people. And um, it's sin begins in the heart. It's part of the heart's feeling. Um, we have a thing, well, basically it's called inclination to sin. And it's called concupiscence. And we all have that. And that's why there is reconciliation or confession. There's several names for that after baptism. Because as human beings and human nature, we have an inclination to sin. And so basically, uh, that's what we're talking about. On that part, in other words, sin is willfully rejecting good and choosing evil. In judging the degree of sin, it is customary for to distinguish between uh, mortal or venial sin, dividing sin, uh, the Bible, the Old Testament calls it deadly sin or not deadly sin. And so deadly sin would be what we call mortal sin. And the root of sin, as I mentioned, is in the heart of, of us. And I used a lot, what I have found, um, Uh, very helpful is uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And um, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it's uh, 1850, paragraph 1850, uh, talks about um, sin. And so if you want to expand on what we're covering and what we say tonight, uh, go to that and you will find that as a, as a good reference. Um, the church classifies sin into two basic categories, venial sin and mortal sin, or deadly sin and not deadly sin. Venial sin is an offense against God, which does not deprive the sinner of sanctifying grace. So in other words, you are not turned away basically from God completely. And then there's mortal sin, which is a a grievous um, grave matter and the criteria for or conditions for a sin to be mortal is that it is a grave matter. You give full consent. You know what the consequences are and you do it anyway. And so it would be like we could we could use a lot of examples. It could be like adultery. I mean, you you know the 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 the, the sinful nature of of, of man, and um, um, he's married, and he goes with someone else, breaks the bond of marriage. There, he is aware of that. He has knowledge of what that is, and full consent. He does it anyway. That would be an example of mortal sin. It's a, probably the best part of, of um, delineating between um, sin and not sin is in Galatians 5, uh, Paul talks about um, the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. And the flesh is impurity, jealousy, sloth, anger, envy, drunkenness, carousing. And the gifts of the spirit is love, joy, self-control, modesty, faithfulness, kindness, peace, patience, generosity, 
goodness, and gentleness. And uh, that's covered in the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 1857. And so uh, on any of this, because I don't have them all listed on the handout, you know, if you want to just kind of write in um, that, then you can reference that and go back to that. Uh, venial sin is covered in the CCC 1426 and uh, mortal sin in CCC 1857. Um, so, you know, sin isn't just about, um, well, it is about behavior, but it's relationships also. Um, um, turning your face away from God. And so um, we try to um, live a good life and understand just what sin entails. The following understandings in the, the next graph, the following understandings of sin have uh, proven helpful. St. Basil the Great um, says sin is a misuse of powers given us by God for doing good, a use contrary to God's commandments. And we remember the Ten Commandments, basically the Decalogue from the Old Testament, they are the Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, the first three commandments talk about our relationship with God, like uh, do not take the Lord's name in vain, uh, love the Lord your God, uh, keep holy the Sabbath day. Uh, the commandment four through ten is basically our relationship with our neighbor. Uh, do not steal, do not covet, do, you know, do, do not kill, and so forth and so on. And so um, uh, that's kind of uh, the difference there in how we are to act by keeping the Ten Commandments. Um, in James 4, chapter 4, 13 through 17, it talks about uh, how we should live today the right way. And basically, as we sit here tonight and think about that, we know how we should live the right way, just like you do. And this is, uh, this is, this is a good thing. Um, and then I, and I've got at the bottom of that, sin and sinning are not secret, simply because it is known to ourselves and obvious to others, while obviously being always known to God. And so then we go to the next one, the seven cardinal sins violate various parts of the Ten Commandment. Um, sin is a disorder, it's a disease. And every disease should have an, an antidote um, or an opposite. And so we're talking about morality tonight also, and so the opposite of the sin would be a virtue. And, you know, I mentioned in the next one, I think you can see that the seven cardinal sins. And I think I told you before, and Adam, and I always say this in the classes, I always, uh, I always memorize everything. I remember in, um, in college years and years and years ago, I won't even tell you how long, but I mean, I would use mnemonics or, or an acronym or something, you know. And so, um, like, I remember the sacraments by B champ, B E C H A M P, and so uh, B is baptism and E is Eucharist and so forth. And then the seven cardinal sin is pale eggs. So we have pride. And then what would be an antidote for pride? Yes, very good. Anger. And the opposite would be love or patience. Lust would be purity, chastity. Envy, honor or kindness. Uh, greed, um, generosity. Gluttony would be being moderate, abstinence, abstaining. Sloth would be more like uh, neat or uh, due diligence, you know, 
so forth. So um, that leads us to the uh, getting rid of sin and Jesus, God is merciful. And so we turn to his mercy in reconciliation. And so we say, what is reconciliation? And it is one of the sacraments, one of the seven sacraments. And it is called different things. Uh, it's a sacrament of conversion, of confession, because we confess to God. Uh, it's a, a penance um, that we do for removing the temporal punishment due to sin. Um, it's, a, it's a sacrament of healing. A lot of people... Uh, um, just go to confession for, for, for the healing. And um, the, the, the wonderful thing about the sacrament of reconciliation, it reunites us with the uh, love of God and be in communion with him when or if we break that communion. Um, the grace flows, and a lot of times, like a lot of clergy, will go, I know there was a priest that just left uh, St. Joseph's, and uh, he went to confession every week. And I mean, he was the most saintly guy you would ever see walking around. But I mean, he went, and I remember going to confession to him and, and talking to him, and he felt like he should go to confession. He did that every week. Well, a lot of times, uh, people will, will like... Uh, um, Oh, a, um, a spiritual director will recommend like once a month or something like that. But um, the sacrament of uh, forgiveness is, uh, is um, the priest acts in persona Christi of Christ, so he is Christ and gives the absolution that, that we need for the forgiveness of sins. And so... Um, Reconciliation is a sacrament instituted by Jesus Christ in his love and mercy. It is here that we meet the loving Jesus who offers sinners forgiveness for offenses committed against God and neighbor. And that's um, CCC. I do have that listed, 1424. Um, the um, sacrament um, of healing... Um, you know, and I was going to go into the um, uh, penance or anointing, but uh, that's something a little bit different, although it is a forgiveness of sins. Like, for example, uh, the other day I got a call from one of our parishioners, and his mother was dying, and he said that they told him she didn't, they didn't expect her to live over two days. And uh, Father Jason responded... Um, not right away, and I thought he might be gone, so I called another priest at St. Joe's, and they immediately went over to the hospice, uh, Willard Walker Hospice, where she was, and then Father Jason called me, and he says, I'll go over there, and, and, and Father J. Raj was already there, but I remember asking that priest, I said, will you do the apostolic pardon? And he said, yes. And so the ap apostolic pardon is like baptism. It wipes away all sin and all punishment due to sin. And so a person goes straight to heaven. And uh, uh, it, is only, it is only used when death is imminent. So like in other words, any of us, we have surgery scheduled tomorrow or next week, you probably, you wouldn't get an apostolic pardon. You know, you'd get an anointing, anointing of the sick. But the, the, the anointing of the sick rite includes, you can include apostolic pardon if death is imminent. So, you know, wanted to mention that to you. Um, why is reconciliation necessary? By virtue of his divine authority, Jesus gives the power of absolution to the apostolic ministry. And, you know, it goes back to the Bible. It goes back to Jesus. And that's why, you know, I feel like our faith is so rich in that Jesus built his church. And upon his church, he gave the keys to the kingdom to Peter. 
What you bound on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. You know, and that's an apostolic tradition that is handed down and handed on to the present day. And so I, I kind of feel like, how could people leave the Catholic Church when they realize what it brings forth to us and to our souls? Um, you know, as like this life is like a passing shadow and like uh, as old as I am, I know the shadows are long and I can remember like, it seems like blinking my eyes and I re remember sitting right there where you are and being your age and I'm thinking that's not possible, but it is and it seems like yesterday, that's what's scary. So anyway, but uh, Matthew 16, 29 is a, is a good reference of the, um, of the keys. So, uh, the source of the forgiveness of our sin, Jesus invites us to reconciliation with God. It is Christ, the good shepherd, who offers us forgiveness and the power to turn away from sin. The priest acts in persona Christi, the person of Christ, when administering the sacrament of reconciliation. The priest makes visible the forgiveness and mercy of Jesus in the sacrament of reconciliation. Um, it's actually Christ that absolves and forgives uh, the sinners in, in, in his name. Um, biblical foundation for the sacrament of reconciliation, I've got John 20, 22, verses 22 and 23. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, whose sins you retain are retained. And um, uh, Jesus appears to his disciples, uh, remember, behind uh, locked doors and said, peace be with you. And then in Matthew, the next one is Matthew 16, 29. I got ahead of myself a little bit in giving the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Um, the authority that Jesus gave to his apostles has been handed on. And in 2 Corinthians 5.18, and all of this from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation, namely God was reconciling to the world, to himself and Christ, not counting their trespasses against them and trusting to us the message of reconciliation. Uh, what do I need to be forgiven there can be no forgiveness of sin if we do not have sorrow for sin, at least to the extent that we regret it. We turn back to God, as Jesus said, uh, don't sin again. And this is what um, our desire is when we receive absolution. And it's the conditions are making a good examination of conscience, confess your sins, be sorry for them, resolve to sin no more. You receive absolution and you perform um, the penance that is given. And then the last one is, uh, what is the seal of confession? And we can, we can, the seal of confession is a solemn obligation that is not uh, repeated or broken. And so uh, this is something that has always been there and there's a lot of, um, stories behind that and with that, you know, so. Um, do you have any uh, questions or comments before we get to morality on that? Uh, you've been very good. What a great audience this is. I, I love it. Um, okay, you know what I was thinking of um, when, I, when I was thinking of this um, uh, morality is that um, you know, I went and voted yesterday. And so, um, you know, and I thought a lot about it and tried to research some things and read some things. And, 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 and the moral relativism of today in our society is, um, is rampant and, 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 you know, that is the thing that says, 
you know, I'll choose what's right. And, you know, the teachings of the church, there's objective teachings that the church holds to that we have to follow. And I mean, you think about it, probably number one is uh, the sanctity of life, you know, and um, um, probably um, uh, right behind that is, um, you know, the marriage, which we're talking about. J Julian handles that here at St. Thomas, uh, the, the records and stuff like that. But I mean, in other words, uh, marriage between a man and a woman. And so, you know, the issues that we have, and you know what they are, and, and so forth. And so, you know, we have that to look at. And so, um, I, I just wanted to mention that moral relativism and uh, the church's teaching, and what we are to do is to be able to have a form conscience um, in dealing with, with issues. And so, and I think, I read somewhere recently, and I can't remember exactly where it was. I remember mentioning it in a homily that there's more fallen away Catholics today than there are Catholics. And they are called nuns, N-O-N-E-S. And most of it, a lot of it is they don't agree with the teaching of the church for one reason or another. A person is in a a d marriage and a divorce and, and, and met somebody else and got a civil marriage and uh, there's no annulment and there you go. And then, uh, you know, and then uh, other things about whether it's contraception or whether it's uh, um, so many things that, that, that are out there that we deal with every day that everybody deals with. And so the conscience is, um, You know, I think your th that is formed by knowing and being catechized and knowing the teachings of the church that helps you form your conscience as far as where you stand uh, today. I know that, um, and I've seen it, as old as I am, the example over and over again of families in which the parents have taught their children kind of from day one, I mean, prayers, basic prayers, and, and uh, what the church teaches and things like that, that is so far reaching. And I mean, all of a sudden, if it's not done, you blink your eyes and they're in seventh grade, and they're in 10th grade. And uh, if you just depend on um, the, 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 the catechism that they go to, or if it's a Catholic school they go to, or whatever, a lot of them do a great job, but it's nothing like being catechized at home from day one. And boy, that, that is just so far reaching. I know when I do, any kind of marriage prep and meet with the people, you know, I always just talk about that and try to emphasize that. So um, in this um, morality, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is pure, is there excellence, is there anything worthy of praise? Think about these things. And that's basically, that's from Philippians 4, 7. And, and basically, it's the morality of, of, of a person. Um, the virtue of a habitual and firm disposition to do the good. It allows a person not only to perform good acts, but to give the best of himself. The virtuous person tends toward the good with all his sensory and spiritual powers. He pursues the good and chooses it in his actions. The goal of a virtuous life is to become like God. That's our, our moral standing. And that's what we try to do, imitate uh, Jesus to the best of our ability. Um, the human virtues, attitudes, dispositions, habits, um, they make us master ourselves and to do good in leading enjoying a good moral life. And um, 
the virtuous person does that. There's uh, the cardinal or moral virtues, um, the fruit and seed of a morally good acts. They dispose all the powers of the human being for communion with divine love. And um, the cardinal or moral virtues, uh, you see me again with an acronym, justice, prudence, fortitude, and temperance. JP's free, free throw. Uh, so anyway, uh, prudence, you know, is basically, um, and, I, and I've got them uh, mentioned here. This is in CCC 1805. Um, it's basically the right reason. You know, you follow prudence, you're following the, the right reason to do things. Uh, justice leads to what we live by the Ten Commandments in the Gospel, teaches us to give what is due to God and man, perfects the will and safeguards the rights of man, disposes us to give everyone what belongs to them. Um, teaches us to live by the Ten Commandments. Um, I, I put a note by my side where I just scribbled it. Uh, justice respects God. Uh, res you respect God, so you're respecting your love, your fellow man. You love your neighbor. You love God and love your neighbor. When uh, just recently, I think in one of our readings, the two great commandments, you know, to love God and love, love your neighbor. Uh, temperance is like, um, you know, moderation. Um, here, here's where we go back to the heart, you know, the flesh. I mean, it's all good, and yet if we can have temperance and moderation, so, you know, whether it's drinking alcohol or whether it's eating or whether it's anything, you know, it's hard for us sometimes to put something down. I mean, I want ice cream, I want another one, or one, you know, whatever it is. And uh, so, so to train ourselves in that respect, like you do, is, is, is really, really the answer. Uh, uh, fortitude, um, I remember I had a coach uh, when I was playing football in college, and he always talked about intestinal fortitude, and I didn't know if he was swearing at me or not. I didn't know, I didn't know what he was talking about. But anyway, the fortitude is, uh, you know, just being strong in difficult situations. And so um, to have that fortitude is, uh, is important. Um, the virtues, the different virtues, the theological virtues, um, do you know what they are? No. Yes, thank you. Um, faith, hope, and charity, or faith, hope, and love. Um, um, faith in the CCC is 1814. Faith is a theological virtue by which we believe in God and believe all that he has said and revealed to us, and that the church proposes for our belief because he is truth of himself. By faith, man freely commits his entire self to God. For this reason, the believer seeks to know and do God's will. The righteous shall live by faith. Um, and basically, Faith works through charity, through love, and uh, so it all kind of fits together. Uh, I was trying to think of something. Oh, I think it's aromatic, uh, where, you know, there are a few of the uh, hermits and so forth that lived in, uh, you know, just um, 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 self-sacrificing type of life, bare bones, you know, and just committed a lot of uh, devotion uh, to God, to the eternal life uh, in the way they lived their life. 
Hope is a theological virtue by which we de desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal, ha eternal life as our happiness. Placing our trust in God's promises in whatever we do each day. So in other words, um, you get up in the morning and you say, good morning, Jesus. And you look at your lamp or a light or a candle, a light to guide us. Uh, we look at a crucifix that we have in our apartment or in our home, uh, God's love. And then we have a Bible around or something. The word is inspired, so the presence of God. Or if we can be here at adoration, God's presence is there in, in the blessed sacrament. So uh, this is uh, really the hope. And then um, that becomes almost, it does become a habit and it becomes automatic. And then we, through that and through our practice and our daily living, uh, we become more uh, as God would, would want us to be. Uh, and the charity is um, living um, uh, our life to help someone else. We do whatever we can uh, to live a good life by example and by by helping someone else uh, there. And then I wanted to uh, close with a, um, uh, am I doing okay? Is it be okay, Adam, if we have, I don't know if we have some questions or whatever, but um, uh, character is the moral qualities of a person founded on his or her temperament and developed by free choices which distinguish one as an individual. A person's habitual virtues and failings, which make one a distinct moral individual, in a praiseworthy sense, character is the integration of a person's um, desire to live the good life. And so, you know, our moral character is, uh, is, is practiced and, uh, and, and lived like that. Um, this was a uh, um, tremendous opportunity and a pleasure to all of you that are listening and being, this is being live streamed, so uh, really happy about that. And uh, uh, we wish you were here, but we understand with COVID and the things that we're going through. Um, anyway. Anna, it's good to see you and to have Julian and Adam here. And then um, I just wanted to uh, uh, see if there was any questions anybody had, and we can end with a prayer. Pardon? Oh, you have. Oh, good, Oh, that's great. How how are you enjoying uh, this process? Are you is it has it been good? Wow. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, so, 
We will, what do we have? Uh, we have uh, uh, mass next uh, RCIA meeting, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, very good. I don't know if you heard Adam, but he said uh, uh, next uh, RCIA class will have uh, the Mass, and Father Jason will present, and then we'll have the Eucharist, and Father Jason will present. Uh, thank you, Adam. And also we have, uh, uh, you know, Thanksgiving coming up and so forth. So anyway, but, but we'll keep you posted. Um, can we close with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, Jesus, thank you for our blessings. We lift up everybody on this live stream and those here in the church. Uh, and are thankful for what we have and the opportunity to know you and love you. We pray for those who are suffering from COVID, those that need our prayers, and for our families, and everybody that uh, is in school, that uh, they can accomplish their objectives and what they need. In Christ's name, amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, thank you.